During the filming of Abuse, I was overwhelmed by Philip Hawkins' story. For weeks, I agonized over the footage. Our talks live from spontaneity and authenticity, so I concluded to release it in full and in two parts, but introduce it here with this warning. This video contains disturbing descriptions of child abuse and violence against and amongst parents, psychological and physical. If you are a recovering victim or abuser, or if you feel unstable, it is advisable to watch this video in the presence of a trusted person or to skip the explicit passages. They are highlighted in the description below the video and on our website. Philip's openness is a most treasurable gift to us all. It is inspiring and it contains valuable suggestions for victims and abusers alike. Not least, it alerts all of us not to turn a blind eye. And I hope that by us talking about this sensitive subject, we will inspire people with the hope that uh, healing can happen. And we don't need to speak about how that is done. It's enough that you and I are vulnerable and open. So, uh, Philip, I'd like to first um, uh, introduce you a little bit to my audience. Um, <clears throat> All his life, Philip has been in a role as a carer of sorts, a mentor, a tutor, a support worker, a lecturer, a teacher. And he has done so in psychiatric wards, in prisons, in the police force, uh, in town councils, and so on. Besides training other career carers, other people who care and do social work, such skills as aggression management or assertiveness. His clients were people with autism, learning disabilities, addictions, and other complex needs. In a maximum security prison, he delivered Reiki training also to um, high-risk inmates. He has found time also to write 17 books and is founder of the women's or women's community support group, Sisters of Support. Hello, Philip. Good morning, Rene. How are you? And thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I, I'm sad here thinking, is that me? Have, <laughs> have, I, have I done all of those things? Well, wait until our visitors go and look at the biography in the description of the video uh, and they will uh, be amazed. You have achieved a lot of things and been very active. But I want to zero in on Sisters of Support. <clears throat> How dare you found a community support group? You're a man, you're not a sister. Uh, tell us briefly how that came about. Very simple. I've got two friends, two lady friends. Uh, and the one thing that we share is that we all have mental health issues, myself included. Um, and during a conversation with both of them separately, uh, it very quickly, I very quickly realized that there was a need for uh, a group to support uh, women with mental health issues, the, uh, a, a safe environment yes. where they could come together uh, and connect and share their thoughts, their fears, their beliefs. And when my two friends pointed out that that did not exist, I thought, well, I'm going to make it exist. I'm going to make it a reality. So I contacted both of them. I said, it now exists. You call it what you want. I will fund you initially to till you get up 
running, you get the facilities organized. I will give you some money to do that. I will then step back and allow you to do whatever. That group is now established. They meet on a regular basis. I offered to be one of their speakers and I was politely told no. <laughs> and you, you said something very important to open a space, a safe space. And uh, uh, I, I think it's all right for a man to open f a safe space for women. But like that refusal is also indicative that uh, very often we need to be amongst ourselves. A long time ago in the 90s, I had a friend, an English friend in the UK, and he worked also in prison. He has uh, passed away in the meantime. God bless him. Rest in peace. Ar Anthony Arthur's. Anthony Artis was his name. Did you ever come across him? He did work in prisons. No, I didn't. Uh, okay. I've got to be honest. Um, the prison I worked in was a high uh, maximum security prison that uh, is not very far away from where I live. And because I was teaching in the community, I got the opportunity to go into the prison um, and deliver Reiki as a personal, de uh, personal development technique, if you want, or a, a way of trying to find that better understanding of yourself. Anthony's yeah. uh, observation was that, uh, and more importantly, the, um, the officials in the prisons, they noticed that with the Reiki work, work <clears throat> work in the prison, uh, violence uh, decreased, substance abuse decreased, and resocialization re uh, was more smoothly for a lot of prisoners. Um, I'm sure you found similar, similar results in your work. Very much so. One of the things, one of the memories that sticks in my mind is that after one of my classes, uh, an inmate, a prisoner, whatever terminology you, you want to use, came up to me um, and he said, look, I, I don't understand what you, you're doing. I don't, I don't understand the thought process behind it. I don't understand how you can simply stand next to a person and either hold their hand or simply put your hand on the, their shoulder and talk to them. And he said, it's obvious that something has happened, but I can't see anything happening. But he said, you did it to me, and I've been in this institution for 12 years. And the night, or the, 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 the night after your class your, that I attended was the first time in 12 years that I have had a good, sound, solid night's sleep. Yes. yes. So he said, I know something happened. I don't yes. understand what happened. And my reply to that was, well, you don't need to understand. Yes. All you need to do is embrace the effect that that had on your life and yes. accept that things can change yes. even if you don't understand the change process yes yes and often it's very empowering to uh, mirror back to the people in such a situation and it is you who's been doing the good sleeping during the night uh you know it's your own achievement it's uh, empowering yep. the people yep. mm. so if if every time somebody says to me okay abuse where do we where do we begin my answer is always the same. We begin in childhood because that's where it starts, not just for the victim, but for the abuser as well. That's where the seeds are sown. That's where the foundation is laid. And the abuse that I experienced, that I witnessed, that that had such a profound effect on me 
the, for a, certainly a, a, a large part of my life, I was in fear of repeating all of those same patterns in my own life. And then I came to a point where I realized that unless I made changes, all I was going to do was just repeat everything that had happened to me because a lot of abuse is traditional. It is passed on from one generation to another. My, yep. You know that fear you just mentioned, which I all too know, uh, all too well know myself. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but when you spoke, it occurred to me that um, because you also said that the, for the abuser, for the offender, it started in childhood too. And uh, when you described your just now, I it resonated to me that there is a degree of not agreeing with the offender, but a degree of empathy for the biography of the offender uh, in Absolutely. that process. Absolutely. Um, it, it's My mother was abused by both of her parents. So that, that was the starting point. She was abused by both her father and the mother. Now, the abuse that she went through was far worse than anything that I had to suffer. But it's it's like a ripple effect. It has, it, it has a knock-on effect. And you can, you can rationalize it, you can intellectualize it, you can sit down and, and discuss it in a safe environment. But when you are in that moment, where you see violence that is beyond any kind of human comprehension. It affects you at such a deep level. It becomes almost cellular. And that you then carry that throughout your life. I still have it with me today, but the very fact that you and I are sat here at this moment discussing this topic proves to me beyond any shadow of a doubt yeah, that you can survive it. But more than that, you can learn from it and you can get to the point where you say, I've got a choice. I can either allow this to destroy me or I can allow it to empower me, to make a change, to help people that have gone through the same situation i can become that light at the end of the dark tunnel mm. i can't i can't change people's lives people come up to me and say philip thank you so much you changed my life you transformed my life my answer is always the same no i didn't i don't live your life you yes. do. so all i've done is given you a thought, a word, an experience that worked for me and you've taken it and you've run with it and you've and, used it. And you're living a life uh, where you where you express that vulnerability and you're you're standing up to your own biography, you're, you're accepting your own biography, you're not in denial of it and you have... Uh, and and I'd like to think that's true for me too. Embraced to to a degree, yeah. uh, and in my term and in my uh, mindset, the word of reconciliation and forgiving is is not far away. Um, but that's not necessarily the the language or the process uh, I'm addressing here in this video. But the experience. Um, to have come through uh, traumatic experiences, then come to a juncture like you described, where you're making a conscious choice. Um, do I let this burden, which was put on my shoulders, destroy me? Or am I going to learn to cope with it? Uh, and even better, to eventually to let it go. 
Um, I'd like to be a little less abstract and talk about concrete examples. Um, so uh, in what was very, um, because you mentioned to me that you had experienced directly abuse and, um, uh, and it resonated with me. And my abuse was not so much, I wasn't beaten, I wasn't sexually abused, but I witnessed this as, as a child. So I had a, um, uh, my papa wasn't my biological father, so it doesn't matter, but it, it is my papa as a child and I loved him, I still do. And my, my mommy, uh, who physically, biologically was actually my grandmother. So these are the people I grew up with. And Papa was a was a drunk, uh, and each time a drunkard. So each time when he came home drunk, uh, there was physical violence against my mother. Now I was a little boy in bed sleeping, but uh, when he came home uh, and the beating started, of course I would wake up, right? And uh, this is a very painful situation for me as a little boy because I was suffering. What do I do now? I had fear. I I was uh, um, shame was there. I didn't know what to do. Helplessness, uh, and there were uh, moments where I mustered all my courage and got up and I basically stood in front of mommy and said, "Please stop, daddy. Uh, I don't want you to beat mommy. Uh, please be kind with each other." And she would pick me up put me back to bed, uh, tuck me in, um, pacify me with uh, kind words. And she would go back. And this time she would go to the guest room at the very end of the apartment uh, in order for me not to hear the noise. And of course, and this is another uh, taboo, um, then uh, the physical violence uh, ended also with uh, her um, surrendering to certain sexual activities. Um, and it, it was an act of survival for her to, to do sexually what she had to do. Um, and of course, the child, the boy, even if he didn't see it physically on the spot, he knew precisely what was going on. So this is the abuse which had a very profound effect on me, a uh, lifelong effect on me, uh, a sensitivity when it comes to injustice, when it comes to transgression of violent, physically violent or sexual abuse, manipulative um, to this to this very point, to this point in life for me today. And to some degree, even my reconciliation work I'm doing for the Reiki community, at the root of this uh, goes back to this these kind of childhood uh, experiences. Now I've speak and spoken about my experience, and I'm, no doubt you have seen much worse biographies. And I know that you yourself uh, have probably had uh, experienced worse things than I had. Um, so if you my, uh, would you tell me a little bit, would you tell us a little bit about how your year was, how you experienced abuse? No problem at all. If I could just, if you like, set the scene as to the level of violence that I experienced and the level of violence that I'm talking about. When you talk to, to people about violence, they usually their experience is punching, slapping, that kind of thing, or the, the, the sexual violence of someone imposing themselves on another person. That is nothing like the level of violence that I experience. And when my mother, as I've already said, my mother was abused by both of her parents physically, mentally, emotionally. When my mother was in the late teens, early 20s, she was babysitting one of my cousins. He was being a pain in the backside. He was being a nuisance. He, he was five years old. Yeah. Um, now, because of my mother's mental health, she had 
bipolar, manic depression. She was all, she also had a violent personality disorder. She could go from one to a hundred in a split second on the rage seal where she lost control completely. And this day, my cousin was being an absolute nuisance. I was told that he picked something up, he threw it at my mother. He then, bear in mind, five years old, he then crawled under the kitchen table to get out of the way. But by this time, my mother had lost complete control. She reached under the table, grabbed him by his hair, dragged him out, picked up a carving knife that was on the kitchen table and cut his throat. Luckily, he did not die because there were members of her family that were present were able to overpower it and take the knife off her. Later in life, I was made to stand and watch whilst I held my sister's hand, who was four years younger than me, bearing in mind I was probably only seven or eight myself. And I was made to stand as my mother went to do the same thing with my older brother. I was forced to stand there and watch that to teach us a lesson. This is what happens when you do something wrong. That is over 65 years ago. If I sit quietly, I can still hear both of them screaming. My brother for his life and my mother because she is completely lost and out of control. That's the level of violence that I witnessed. I, rem I have a, a memory of when I was four or five years old myself. My mother had been out one night. She was addicted to drugs. She was also an, not an alcoholic, but she had a very strong dependency on alcohol. And because of her violent nature, she was continuously getting into fights and all sorts. And she came in one night. My grandmother was babysitting. My mother walked through the door. And as the, was the fashion in them days, she had like a tie belt um, coat, um, trench coat type of thing. And it was literally covered in blood from chest height down to the hem, completely. And when she pulled her hands out of her pockets, both of her wrists and her arms were cut to ribbons because she'd put windows out with her fists. That's the level of violence. Now, when you go through that as a child, you are not fearful of not getting fed at mealtime. You are not fearful of not getting a present for your birthday. You are fearful of your own life, that it can be ended in a split second. And that is the fear that I live with throughout my childhood and into my teens. And that was the main cause of me trying to murder my abuser, my own mother, when I was 18 year old. And I came frighteningly close. So close because I was using manual strangulation and any psychologist will tell you that that act is a very hateful, vengeful way of inflicting pain on somebody. And I was so close to her. 
I could actually see the light going out of her eyes. My own vision turned blood red. People say, oh, I saw red. When you are so intense, when the, 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 the emotion is so powerful, it can affect your vision to such an extent, you begin to physically see red. I don't know what saved her. But I do know that whatever it was saved her from so dying saved. that moment and it saved me from probably either a life in prison or a life in a psychiatric hospital for the mentally insane. That's the level of abuse, the fear that I experienced. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's shocking, um, and you know, in these conversations, normally uh, there's a light amusement, a little video. We are philosophizing, and of course, uh, you and I are going to an entirely different level. Uh, and I'm glad we do because um, all too often it's so easy to hold hands and watch the sunset and uh, don't we all love our, each other and be in that stage um but i sometimes feel that this is sometimes pregnant with denial uh and not having spoken the truth um and i s severely believe that particularly in a conscious reconciliation process the, uh, the the terror and the, the horror of such situations needs to be um, in a in a sane mind or in a healthy environment. It needs to be looked at, and it needs to be uh, acknowledged that it happened. And uh, in that context, I think what you just said. As painful as it is to listen to you, and uh, I'm sure that every viewer is empathizing with that boy you were then. Um, as as important it is to 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 not look away, to not blink, uh, and the the generations, you know, your mother having experienced violence, then being violent with you and your siblings and you being at the verge of entering of continuing this this behavior pattern uh, and that's what so uh, that's why I think <laughs> why it's so important to look at these things and, and 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 try and heal them or or at least cope with them in a in a non-damaging uh, way um, and I said in my introduction, this has to do with generations of our children and their children, but also going back to our ancestors, because, because uh, the mother of your mother may have experienced the same thing. Um, and I spoke at the beginning about having had a uh, been adopted in another in Switzerland. Um, in an, in an environment and, and, and my father was an alcoholic and I, unbeknownst to me, my biological father had four other children in Italy, right? And um, uh, as a grown man, I was in thirties, I, I discovered them for the first time. Um, and uh, it was very interesting to speak to uh, my siblings, uh, three girls and one boy. The youngest is a boy. The eldest are three girls. And um, our common biological father was also a violent person. And one thing uh, I have in common with my younger half-brother is that both of us experienced violence and being so incompetent, uh, impotent is the more precise word, completely and utterly impotent as a young boy uh, wanting to protect, in his case, the older sisters and his mother, and in my case, my grandmother, uh, and not being able to. 
and coming to the point and when uh, the first thing my uh, my half brother when i met him the first thing the first time within 15 minutes he told me um he left home and uh, when he got back home as a grown man um, and he had uh, was in the army at that moment his uh, father came home and he was visiting his mother and he knew that if he the father raises his hand against the mother he's going to kill him and it wasn't a figure of speech no like like you and it it's so close to uh the question of one's own survival you didn't you didn't do what you did for much other reason than your own fighting for your own survival. Now that doesn't justify violence and it certainly doesn't justify killing another person far from it. Um, yet, uh, these are the kind of dynamics most of us have one way or the other experienced. And I think men in particular, uh, are very close to that, uh, physical violence uh, which is not far away from physically killing another person would you agree with what i just said you with your experiences in absolutely. the psychiatric absolutely in, one of the things that you said that i really do feel fully passionate about is that the child does not have the voice to question the child does not have the 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 power to challenge what is happening so the only option left to that child is to simply accept it but in that acceptance the child takes on all sorts of 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 guilt and childish misconceptions conceptions about right wrong what they should have done as a child but of course we know that the child can't do anything the child is a victim but one of the things that i try to get across to to my students is that and, and a lot of people find this very difficult to accept until i explain it when i say that the view of the abuse is not personal now people say well it's very personal to me yeah it is the abuse that happened to me was very personal on a very personal level but the abuse that happened was not because of me me being philip yeah you could have taken me out of the equation and put a total different person into that position and the abuse would have been exactly the same the abuse is personal to the victim but it's not personal to the abuser because it's a part of who they are they and they're not abusers aren't born we we would like to think that because that helps us try to get our brain around what is a very a very painful a very complex situation that we are faced with that abuse happens all the time and i feel very very strongly that the the people that promote this abuse is not the abusers themselves but the people that do nothing, the people that are aware that the abuse is happening. My family knew how dangerous my mother was, but they never in, got involved. They never interfered. I never saw a social worker. I never saw a police officer coming. I never saw neighbors coming to see how we were because people did not want to get involved they knew it was happening but it yeah. was easier for them for their survival to turn away and pretend that they couldn't see it 
and it, that's what exactly what went through my mind when you described the child's position so so correctly um the child often cannot do anything yes so, uh, uh, we can uh, educate our children to the point that we say uh, go and ask for help speak to neighbors speak to auntie speak to your godfather and of course in abusive and uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for, misfunctional uh, families, uh, of course, yeah. that doesn't happen. The opposite happens, that yeah. the environment is suppressing the children and is making them addicted and, 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 and fearful and not take, yeah. see the possibility that they could go. However, when you spoke, it uh, went through my mind, and uh, I'm glad you said this at the end, that uh, we, outside of the families, we can uh, be more aware and yes, we do hear when the neighbor is screaming and yelling. Oh, we all do occasionally, but that's one thing. But when it happens regularly, when there is uh, violence, let's not uh, shy away of, uh, of kindly and politely um, interfering and asking questions. Could I give you an example? Please. As I've said, my mother was abused horribly by my grandmother and my grandfather. Yeah. My grandfather had a brain injury when he was three years old. And it it the the injury caused severe brain damage. The doctors that attended uh it was actually playing out in the street, three years old, playing out in a village street. He fell under the wheel of a horse and cart and it split his head from the crown all the way down over his left brow, damaging the frontal cortex of his brain. The doctor said, prepare for the funeral because a, a child with such damage cannot survive. If it does, he will be a cabbage. It didn't die, it wasn't a cabbage, but it grew up to be an extremely, extremely violent, evil man. He beat men, women, and children with equal ferocity. My mother told me that he used to beat his own mother to such an extent that she would have to sit with leeches on her face to draw off the blood just so that she could open her eyes to see. One of my grandfather's favorite tricks would be that my grandmother, bless her, was five feet tall, tiny little lady. My grandfather was a big strapping man, six foot odd, pitman, yeah, very powerful man. And my grandmother, her hair was right way down, past her nearly down to her knees and what he used to do when the mood took him was that he would wrap his hand in a hair and then he would drag her up and down the street stopping outside of neighbors doors and punching my grandmother till her face was just a, a complete mess and he would stand and he would dare anybody to come out and stop him. And that's the kind of thing that my mother grew up witnessing on a regular basis. Is it any wonder that she was as damaged the way that she was? It's a very valid question, and uh, one could now say, well, this is, you know, many generations back. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, one could say that, uh, but that's also not being honest. That's also not looking at the here and now, because uh, if we're looking at the violence, which still is today, and um, I'm going to come to a close now, and we will continue talking, uh, Philip, and maybe there's going to be two sequels of, uh, of this art talk, okay? 
but That's I'm going to come to a close here uh, for the moment, where I'm saying, um, and this is this is where we are in our conversation, looking at these horrible things, and basically there's two 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 summaries, two conclusions. One. Uh, let's not be naive and close our eyes to the violence and the abuse which is around us right now today. And two, um, you and I spoke about this in such transparency and openness because I take the liberty of saying that we have liberated ourselves from the ill feelings, the hatred, towards our parents, to our environment, we've undergone uh, a degree of healing which allows us to have this conversation. And hopefully this observation should inspire people. Not only can you and should you interfere, there's also hope that healing can happen. Absolutely. I've, I've survived because I accepted the past. I accepted its effect on me. I accepted the consequences of my actions. And I accepted the, the things that I did. And that acceptance is part of the healing process. Yes. That I, uh, once I did that, I was no longer a victim. 